So I am delighted to introduce to you our speaker for today. <clears throat> Dr. Keon Gilbert is an associate professor in the Department of Behavioral Science and Health Education at the St. Louis University College for Public Health and Social Justice. He is also the co-founder of the Institute for Healing Justice and Equity. His work draws on an interdisciplinary training in biology, African-American studies, public affairs, and public health to investigate the intersection of racial identity, racial socialization, and structural racism as important yet unexplored social determinants of African-American men's health across the life course. I talked about all of his disciplines, and yes, he has a bunch of alphabets uh, behind his name. He has two master's degrees and a doctoral degree. Um, but in addition to being a really great scholar, he's also one of my best friends. Um, so I'm happy to turn it over to Dr. Gilbert. Thank you, Dr. Goodman and Dr. Umpad, for this wonderful uh, opportunity and invitation uh, to speak to this, this uh, amazing group of folks. Uh, we can't see you, um, but I'm just imagining lots of faces. And uh, I didn't know that my uh, friendship status had moved up to best friend level. So, uh, you know, this is a great, it's a great day all around. It's a great day all around. <laughs> Well, um, given the interest of time and trying to uh, move through a few things uh, rather quickly, um, and we can sort of, um, I'm happy to go back to slides and happy to answer questions um, near the end of this. Um, I'll just jump right in. So I've titled this Health Promotion Efforts to End Inequities in Health. Um, <clears throat> I'll briefly go over uh, just an introduction of health disparities thinking about health behavior strategies within a public health context. Also this idea of how health, inequal health inequalities arise from social determinants of health. I'll go through a couple of models and examples of how we understand health inequities and as well as finish with some models and examples of how do we move towards an anti-racist public health. So um, Dr. Goodman and I actually came up with this, um, this timeline a number of years ago as a way of trying to document and demonstrate that the idea of health disparities, the study of health disparities is, is, is not new in any way, shape, or form. As you can see on this timeline, as, as early as 1899 with the Philadelphia Negro written by W.E.B. Du Bois, as well as his work, The Health and Physique of the Negro in 1906, uh, these were some of the early, earliest works in terms of thinking about health disparities or the differences in black and white health status. Uh, this work also included looking at social economic conditions, as well as even thinking about interventions and practices. Um, then in the 1915, from 1915 to 1951, um, that movement is characterized by the National Negro Health Movement, um, which was largely implemented and supported um, through Tuskegee University, um, Booker T. Washington, and that, that project or that movement and effort really focused on thinking about not only individual health, but community health. And so there were sanitation days, there were days that focused on men's health, there were days that focused on women's health and children, there were neighborhood cleanup days. And so during that time period, there was a real emphasis on thinking about not only how do we document and think about health disparities, but also what are some community-based strategies to improve health for Black communities. Then there was a, a, a lag in, in terms of concerted efforts to think about and, and focus on Black health until 1985. Um, the Black and Minority Health Report, often called the Heckler Report, which documented this idea of burden of disease um, and excess deaths. And from there, we sort of see this more kind of modern movement and thinking about health disparities and a number of different offices and reports that have, that have come since, since then to focus on, on health disparities. You can see a number of offices at the CDC, the National Institutes of Health, the Office of Minority Health, as well as other reports, as well as uh, some of the reports focusing on healthy people. Thinking about the healthy people reports, um, there's been an interest in, in, in in sort of talking about and thinking about health disparities. And as you can see in, in these three different examples of healthy people, there's also been a shift and change in the language. So in Healthy People 2000, 
Um, part of the three overarching goals, increase the span of, he of, of healthy life, reduce disparities, provide access to preventative healthcare services. In Healthy People 2010, two goals, increasing the span of healthy life and eliminating health disparities across categories of gender, race, ethnicity, education, income, et cetera. Then in, um, in, in Healthy People 2020, uh, four goals, uh, thinking about high quality of life, longer life, free of preventable disease, achieving health equity to eliminate disparities and improve the health of all. So again, disparities are the differences. Um, equity is a different sense in terms of thinking about not only equal access, but also thinking about how we provide access to resources that address even the gaps that, that we might see. Creating also social and physical environments that promote good health for all and promoting overall quality of life. I am, excuse me, I'm stuck here. Something's not moving. Okay, there we go. Um, my apologies. So um, <clears throat> here's just a quick look at life expectancy between um, white men, black men, white women, and black women. As you can see, um, the group that sort of lags behind in, in, in life expectancy are black men. And the group that has the highest life expectancy um, is white women. And then you see um, black women and then white men. And when we think about this, this graph of thinking about life expectancy, um, we can see very stark differences. And, and what we'll talk about are, are a few reasons why we see these differences and why these differences have persisted over time. And actually I can extend this trend line all the way back to the, some of the earliest times when we started collecting life expectancy data in the early 1900s. And you'll see the same patterns. So when we talk about disparities and we talk about who's involved, um, this has become sort of a new industry of sorts. Um, I've already talked about the idea that, you know, this has been going on for quite a, quite a while in terms of thinking about and documenting health disparities, but there are a number of different actors that participate in the progress as well as stalling the progress of, of moving this idea of disparities and inequalities and even health equity. We have um, different centers that fund this type of research and support this work from government to non-government to nonprofits. Also, but when we think about the focus of, of particular populations, um, also when we think about where, where do we find information about health inequalities is also really important. So we have professional journals, we have different um, stakeholders in the community, business, as well as community-based community, community -based organizations, and even our professional associations. Right now, we're hearing a lot from professional associations in particular as it relates to the reopening of schools as an example. And you hear lots of different opinions from those in pediatrics, those representing nursing associations, those representing teacher and parent associations. So when we think about these various actors, they all play a role in terms of how we advance as well as, as, well as how, does we, how do we think about what gets in the way of us advancing this work. Dr. Goodman and I, as well as um, Dr. Hudson, who you'll speak with um, later this week, and uh, Dr. Graham Kolditz, we, we did a systematic review of looking at some of the health disparities literature. And I won't go through all, all the methods and details, but I just really wanted to sort of highlight um, a couple of quick things. And so when we think about the roles or, or the efforts to think about disparities, inequalities, and health equity, um, a lot of the work has focused on what we characterize as first generation research, which is documenting or identifying or trying to answer this question, do disparities exist? Second generation is characterized by thinking about why do disparities exist or trying to make causal relationships or causal associations, thinking about causal patterns that contribute to um, why disparities exist. And then we see a smaller percentage of the, of the work being focused on the third and fourth generations. And the third generation is really centered on interventions. Not only are inter interventions in place, but are they working? Are they effective interventions? We see that 5% of studies are focused there. And then a smaller percentage on fourth generation, which really focuses on health equity um, or even anti-racism work, which we'll talk about a little bit as well. And so 
You might wonder why, if we've been doing this since 1899. And there's lots of reasons why. Some of it I've alluded to already in the previous slide of thinking about the different actors that contribute, as well as thinking about the different ways that those actors get in the way. When we look at some, some studies that have tried to focus on determinants of mortality in the US, um, <clears throat> this study from McGinnis and colleagues um, really sort of focuses on this idea of there's an imbalance between social investments and medical care comp compared to prevention activities, where it suggests that they, they suggest that 95% of the trillion dollars we spend um, goes into direct medical care services or direct healthcare services while 5% is allocated to sort of population approaches or what we call public health approaches. When we look at causes of disease, uh, we see that 40% of deaths are caused by behavior patterns. 10 to 15% of deaths may be associated with um, um, access or quality of medical care. 2% of deaths are attributed to genetic factors, um, where some 60% some may be contributed or, or come from chronic diseases, so we can sort of link some genetic factors to chronic death by chronic disease around 60%. 40% is related to health behaviors. 5% um, of deaths may be attributed to environmental factors, so the built environment. 15% or environment or um, toxins and things like that in the, in, in the air. 15% um, of deaths may be attributed to social circumstances, so our social relationships, inability or, or uh, social interactions, those kinds of things. And also they documented that a 1% rise in income inequality is associated with a 4% increase in deaths among persons on the lower end of that, of that spectrum. And so again, we asked the question, why? And, and why the focus or why the investment in health, direct healthcare services and not in broader population um, efforts and strategies that may be, prevent some of these diseases? or causes of death. So I start with the idea of thinking about individual health. And so we focus a lot on individual health, health behavior change. Um, we talk about that almost every day in the news, wearing masks, um, distancing yourself from those that you know, um, washing your hands. And so these are all individual behaviors that we're asking people to constantly think about and to constantly do right now. Um, as, this, as this figure shows, individual health is quite complex. Um, you have a range of different factors that contribute to, to individual health. We have the social environment, the physical environment, your genetic predisposition, how that contributes or manifests in, in your individual body's response um, to those exposures, as well as how your body sort of even processes, for example, being exposed to, um, to the novel coronavirus or, or even the common, the common cold or the common flu. Um, also, we have to take into account access and use of healthcare services, the quality of care that's, that's received, and how that all factors into our general sense of well-being and sort of social economic prosperity as well. So health behavior is complex, as I've already noted. Change of behavior is not as simple as it seems. Behavior is complex and influenced by many factors that we've talked about, and they can include biological factors, personality factors, family and peer influences, community and neighborhood factors, as well as policy. Within public health, we have this sort of sense of um, trying to take a rational and um, cognitive perspective about changing people's behaviors. And it sort of boils down to kind of three, three things. So we approach this thinking that we can talk to, oh, excuse me, <laughs> uh, we can talk to people to help them process the idea of risk and that it's logical and uncluttered. So for example, having multiple partners increases your risk of a sexually transmitted infection. Wearing a mask prevents the spread of COVID-19. We communicate risk information in the form of percentages often or, or thinking about probabilities. So we may say, say to someone, your genotype suggests that you have a 25% chance of transmitting a defective gene or black males aged 15 to 34 are nine times more likely to be killed by police. We also expect that the public will rationally act or respond to this information that we provide them. For example, because breast cancer runs in your family, you should consider all options to prevent this cancer, and that being a prophylactic mastectomy. 
again, sort of we have this rational idea that if we give people good information or we just educate folks, that they will make the best decision um, for themselves. However, one of our earlier models of health, health behavior change, um, the health belief model, and actually it was developed as a response of trying to get people screened for tuberculosis, um, is actually really related to our discussions about COVID-19. This model suggests that people will take action or change their behaviors to prevent, screen, or control for ill health conditions. This is a conditional statement. If they regard themselves as being susceptible, believe the condition has some consequence, believe that a course of action will reduce their susceptibility and severity. And also thinking about the barriers have to be outweighed by the benefits. This is also even factored into our conversations about vaccines or people's willingness to participate in vaccine studies. And this comes from a combination of theories, stimulus response theory, the idea that learning results from events or reinforcements, and behavior is then supported by reinforcement or consequences. And then cognitive theory, where people weigh the value of behavior and decide to engage or not. Our health behaviors are quite diverse, and there's three dimensions related to this, complexity, frequency, and volitionality. Complexity um, suggests that it involves higher levels of knowledge, skill, or resources to perform simple behaviors. The more complicated a behavior, the lower the likelihood it will be performed correctly. Complexity is not always inherent in the behavior and can, and can function, can be a function of the environment. So think about vaccines. Um, some examples come from some previous work of thinking about HPV vaccines and getting um, adolescents and actually even encouraging parents to, to have their children vaccinated. This may be quite easy for someone with, with the means and resources, such as those who live in, who are part of the middle class and live in urban environments compared to those who maybe who live in impoverished areas um, in, in rural communities. So if you think about sort of what we have access to, that also factors into whether or not we're able to perform certain behaviors. Also the frequency of behavior is really important. And so when we think about some behaviors, we do some of them we do more repetitively. So every day we think about what we're going to eat or if we're going to be physically active or choose to not eat healthy or, or physically active. I personally love a good donut. And so sometimes I have to talk myself out of eating donuts because it's not the, the healthiest thing to do. Um, also, when we think about frequency, we think about um, how often we're going to do those. And so, for example, you may only be screened for radon once or if it's more periodic, so obtaining a mammogram for in the case of women. So whether this is an, an annual event or it may sort of a, a happen maybe multiple times within a year given a particular risk profile. Behaviors are also complex, um, but may only require infrequent repetitions such as colorectal cancer screening, or they may be more complex requ requiring this daily repetition that, that I've already mentioned. Then the sense of volitionality the degree of personal control over behavior. So highly volitional behaviors are ones that which the person has complete control. Performing the behavior does not require any external resources or support. For example, flossing. That might be relatively easy. Um, the cost of floss is really low. Other behaviors that are low in volitionality require reliance on external resources. So for example, consuming fresh produce or healthy foods. They may not be readily accessible given, given where you live. And as a result, you're less likely to eat, eat a healthy diet if you don't have access to healthy food. Behaviors also re may, be, may require in, being enforced by local, state, or organizational level policy. We see that now also talking about the ideas of, of mask wearing or, um, or the shelter in place orders that existed um, just a short while ago. And even the idea that many municipalities or states are rolling back some of the reopening um, of certain communities because of the rise of coronavirus rates. Studies have shown that the most effective methods to achieve health behavior suggest that these interventions are carefully planned, um, are developed from strong formative research, and can be theory-based. There's a need for high-quality study designs and methods and, um, um, from systematic reviews, meta-analyses, and also thinking about the broader social, social and physical context that shape and influence behaviors. Some of the challenges that we experience in terms of thinking about individual behavior and thinking about what, how this relates to this idea of health disparities and health equity 
really comes from a mismatch of our value systems. And so I've already mentioned that there's a mismatch in terms of how we fund and support healthcare or, pop or public health. Um, that's also sort of reflected here in this idea of meritocracy and health. So we have a sense that um, we have a really sort of individual sense of, of health here. Personal and societal rewards are bestowed upon on those based on individual agency and resilience. And that leads to economic success and, and prosperity. It's quite an American value that there's a strong aspiration for success and access to opportunity through political, economic, and educational structures. Um, also, when we think about the distribution or the lack of distribution of opportunity, how does that also factor into what we think people deserve or should have as, as a right? There's also a lack of economic and educational success and achievement of political representation. And those are viewed as failures. And so when we see people who are not faring very well in society, we blame them. And we, we attribute characteristics to them such as lack of talent, lack of ambition, skill, or work ethic. So we hear people always sort of refer to African Americans or fo folks that represent Im immigrant communities as being lazy. And in quite, that's, that's quite the opposite. When we see that many of them are working multiple jobs, trying to take care of their families, um, and often multi-generational families, and just trying to sort of achieve this American dream, which really is in some ways counter to, to, to their efforts and energy. We also attribute poor health and lack of healthcare access to individual deficiencies, and we don't really sort of think about structural changes. And these values often guide our policy decisions. Here's um, Dr. Kwate's model of this, uh, of meritocracy and health. And Dr. Kwate is also gonna be talking to you, so don't tell her that I, I stole some of her work and, and talked to you all today. But you can see sort of this idea or this alignment of cultural values to um, public policy and structural inequalities, our social consciousness, ideologies, and how that leads to barriers and opportunity. And also when, when these structural changes are, are persistent, that becomes also embedded in, 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 our, um, um, in our bodies in, in, in a number of different ways. And it also affects our ability to cope with exposures to discrimination and also how we cope with the, the lack of resources in our, in our environments. And also that, as you can see, it, it's directly related to our health behaviors and then also to our health outcomes. So that's one of the reasons why we can sort of think about our one framing in terms of why disparities exist and how they result from systemic inequality. So there's a professional charge to public health um, professionals that Powers and Faden offered a number of years ago. And it says the one critical moral function of public health is to monitor the health of those who are experiencing systemic disadvantage as a function of group membership, to be vigilant for evidence of in inequities relative to those in privileged social groups and to intervene to reduce those inequalities. And that's sort of framing sort of the next set of, set of slides that I wanna to talk to you about and, and sort of where I wanna end in terms of taking on this charge of addressing those that have, been, have experienced systemic disadvantage. And so in many ways, as, as many people have already talked about, we're living in sort of dual pandemics, this idea of racism and, and the novel coronavirus. And there's some language that sort of suggested that the other framing that this is a syndemic. So syndemic populations are the clustering of social and health problems. Um, there's two criteria for a syndemic. syndemic. Um, two or more disease or health conditions cluster within a specific population. Contextual and social factors create the conditions in which two or more diseases or, or health conditions cluster. The clustering of these diseases results in adverse disease interaction either biological or social or behavioral, increasing the health burden of affected populations. And so when we, when we heard very early that COVID-19 is going to largely affect, or those that are gonna be at highest, highest risk are those with um, those who are older, those with chronic conditions, this already sort of set up this idea that there was gonna be sort of this co collision of, 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 of um, health issues. But we weren't expecting for this to also to uncover was that this idea of systemic racism that many, many, many folks and maybe some of you on this, on this webinar are first sort of really thinking about or coming to terms with in a, in a number of ways. And so what happens when we ignore syndemics is that it actually renders some populations quite invisible. 
And so my work on Black men's health or Black male's health over the life course really sort of thinks about the invisibility of, of Black men and even Black populations. And so it, as you see in this infographic, this is also a way of us sort of reframing this to sort of show the visibility of some of the health issues and health conditions. And I don't show you this just to sort of talk about the various risks, but also to sort of think about and then to start structuring how we might consider opportunities for engagement, sources and opportunities for resilience, and, what are, and also identifying the assets in, in those communities where folks that have been systemically disadvantaged live, work, and play. So one part of this is sort of thinking about and unpacking sort of the social economic context and as it relates to health behaviors. <clears throat> so in a paper that did with, some, with a number of colleagues, my uh, colleague Rayshawn Ray um, came up with this typology of sort of thinking about how racial composition affects health behaviors. And the example here is physical activity. And we use black women and, and black men as, as examples here. So as you can see at the top, at the top, middle-class black women who live in um, neighborhoods with a higher percentage of, of, of black people may be more economically disadvantaged, feel less safe, and are often sexualized. And that will lead to less physical activity. And populations or communities or neighborhoods that have um, lower racial composition, there may be more physical activity because they feel that they're, they are safer neighborhoods or areas because of less crime, um, there may be more facilities, more green spaces. Um, also, there may be higher opportunities for social and economic advantage, as well as access to healthcare services. When we look at middle class black men, the, almost the reverse is true. There is more physical activity in areas where there are higher percentages of, of black people. They feel more comfortable. There are higher sources of social support and social capital. Although that those environments also in include economic disadvantage and less access to healthcare. And so within the same environments, you see differences in behaviors according to this typology, where black men also then feel less safe in, in neighborhoods or communities that are more white because of racial profiling and criminalization. And so see, we, we see here that in many different ways, black women are sexualized in places and spaces where black men feel comfortable. Um, and in places and spaces where black men feel let feel more comfortable um, or let or I'm sorry less comfortable those are places that they are often criminalized and so we often have to really sort of unpack these social and physical environments and how they relate to health behaviors there's a number of health promotion strategies that we can employ to think about how do we how do we make some shifts and changes and part of that is really thinking about the multiple environmental influences on health thinking about how we can sustain health, health promotion change or health, health behavior change to think about systems and structures and to think about the interactions of those systems and structures to not only encourage and, and influence health behavior, but also to sustain that change. And without really sort of systemic changes, we can't really begin to getting people to think about changing their behaviors in the ways that we've been talking about lately in, in public. So now this bring me, brings me to this idea of the social determinants of health. And um, <clears throat> Brennan, Baker, and Metzler sort of came up with this idea of, of social determinants, thinking about it from, from a, using a tree perspective. So you see that the, the unhealthy tree um, and the healthy tree have many of the same issues in both, in both settings and contexts. However, what's in the, what's in the soil um, are also very different. You have polar opposite situations. But also what's really important is the trunk. And so we can think of the trunk as being sort of our policies and systems and structures and different pathways that can either further harm communities or mitigate against the negative things that we might, that people may be exposed to as a result of what's in the soil. And so if we think about social determinants of health where people live, work and play and worship, we can use this tree, this tree metaphor as a way of sort of articulating or thinking about how these, how these different environments or how the exposures to different environments may, be, may sort of differentiate themselves um, depending on what's available in the trunk. So thinking about the pathways and the mechanisms and policies that may change those, those um, opportunities. Also, um, the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative came up with this model of thinking about social determinants of health. You see sort of upstream factors being social inequalities, 
um, race, class, ethnicity, sexual orientation, institutional inequities. And then you have downstream this idea of health behaviors and sort of what are the more proximal determinants or factors that influence health behavior change and how they relate to morbidity and mortality. As you can see, there are also other, other opportunities or structures that might help sort of mitigate against um, um, social inequities and how they arise through strong partnerships, advocacy, community capacity building, um, policy making, and even sort of at the sort of healthcare or, or individual health behavior thing um, end, end of this, we can also think about how do we develop um, opportunities to integrate lay health workers, community health workers, to sort of build wraparound services in a number of different ways. Tom Frieden came up with an, a, a slightly different model of helping us to think about where this investment or where this mismatch has been in terms of our focus on individuals versus larger structural change. And as you can see in this pyramid, um, we have the smallest impact on um, health behaviors, um, telling people to eat, eat healthy and to be physically active compared to addressing systemic issues such as poverty, education, housing, and inequality. And in the middle, you see sort of some other opportunities or other, other ways that we think about health behavior change. And really what this does is that it's, it helps it further explain the persistent disparities that we see that lead to inequalities. We see also this, um, this idea of thinking about the SES gradient in health. Um, also, when we think about education as, as one of those strategies or structures, how that can or even um, not help some groups in terms of advancement towards, um, towards being healthy. Also, the idea of resources and place matter. Um, people having access often to resources because of where they live and changing those structures and opportunities actually can increase resource, um, resource acquisition. Rod Shetty, in, in their work of race and economic opportunity, looked at this as it relates to comparing inter intergenerational effects and opportunities looking at black, black and white boys. There were several conclusions made. Black boys have lower earnings than white boys in 99% of census tracts in America. That's quite devastating. And that's even controlling for parent income. Both black and white boys have better outcomes in quote unquote good neighborhoods, those with low poverty, higher rent, um, but, black, but the black white gap is bigger in such areas as well. When we think again, sort of back to that typology I showed, that may help to explain some of those reasons in terms of what happens in the social interactions when people move to quote unquote good neighborhoods. Within low poverty areas, there are two factors associated with better outcomes for black boys in smaller gaps, greater father presence and less racial bias. I'm not gonna address the father presence, the, the sense of father presence um, today because I, um, that's sort of a more complicated issue, I think. Um, but also we can sort of think about this idea of racial bias and that relates to the typology that I showed. Neighborhoods also have causal childhood exposure effects. And so some of you may study adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and sort of that factors in here. So black boys who move to good areas at a younger age do better. That also takes into account a life course perspective of trying to make some changes early or intervening early in life that may have sort of different outcomes or better outcomes long-term. In a photo essay I did actually with Dr. Goodman um, just, just a couple of years ago, uh, actually last year, sorry, we looked, at, um, we looked at neighborhoods just by photos in St. Louis. And so you see what you may consider good houses, bad houses, good neighborhoods, bad neighborhoods. And one of those neighborhoods or one of those houses is actually the house of a couple that became very famous most recently because they brandished guns during a Black Lives Matter pro protest while they were on the way to the St. Louis, um, the city of St. Louis mayor's house to ask for her resignation. And that's the house sort of down, down below the big, um, the, uh, the big stone house that you see. The house above it actually is sort of a, a great juxtaposition in terms of the Shelley house, which was one of the case studies in ending restrictive racial covenants to end residential segregation um, here in St. Louis, as well as um, Detroit. And it becomes sort of national case studies in terms of the Supreme Court decisions to try to end these practices of uh, residential segregation. Also, when you look at these neighborhoods, you may, even within them, you may say what's good and what's bad, 
but also you may see also in, in, in the house on, on, the, on, on the other side with the paintings of local community heroes as a form of resilience and as, as a form of showing that there's incredible assets in these communities that have produced local leaders who have helped to make some significant changes in, in those areas. Also, when I think about this idea of neighborhood context or social context, um, did a study here in, in St. Louis of looking at some, looking at some data from, um, from a COH study that um, collected data from 118 African-American men recruited from a clinical site here that looked at segregated neighborhoods um, and the racial composition of, of, of those neighborhoods and found that segregated neighborhoods and segregated occupations or workplaces increase the risk for hypertension by four times and three times respectively. The study also showed that exposures to racial residential segregation and segregated workplaces became a cumulative risk for hypertension for black men in this study. The study also showed that low integration exposure to opportunity in other time points of life showed a cumulative burden of discrimination. So again, this idea of thinking about when and where should we, should we intervene? And part of that is thinking about doing it very early, as well as we have to sort of really unpack and think about the environments that people move in and out of, not only throughout a given day or, or given week, but across their life course and how that might, might influence or increase their risk for chronic diseases such as hypertension. As we sort of think about this move of social determinants to an anti-racism practice, practice, practice excuse me, um, there are a number of things that we can consider. Developing anti-racism racism programs and initiatives to change cultural awareness about differences, promoting healing justice, not just social justice, reducing bias, increasing activism. Also reimagining work in, within, um, within communities, with, within the various spaces and places that you interact in as a way of thinking about how do you change them to increase individual and collective capacities to achieve health equity. Also using multiple forms of data to understand the range of social issues. So here I just showed you a quantitative example as well as thinking about sort of this idea of even using photo, photo essays or the stories of communities to talk about differences, to talk about historical inequalities, as well as being able to model them using, our, using statistics. And to use that evidence to move us from first generations to for, for third and fourth generation types of work. Also thinking about ways that we can integrate models of health promotion, allowing for participatory approaches, mixed methods, anti-Black racism, and equity models. These are really important um, considerations. As, as you see, there are a number of state and local governments that are, that are considering or have passed declarations of racism as a public health crisis. That's great, that's wonderful, and it's an important first step. However, the, some of the recommendations here may help you all to move your municipalities or states along a, along a, a trajectory that will allow them to, to move beyond just making mere statements, but actually developing action plans. So this idea of moving from 1619 to 2020, so there's been 401 years um, since the inception of, of slavery, um, and that really sort of helps us to frame and to think about um, the environments that, that Black people in particular, as well as other groups, um, live in and the experiences of, dis of discrimination and their contributions to stressful social and economic living conditions and how that um, in increases restricted access to resources and affects their ability to cope. Also, the life course perspective, which I've talked about a couple of different times, and thinking about different time points in life that we can intervene. Intersectionality, the idea of addressing the intersections of race, gender, social class and place, and even sexual orientation or sexual identities is very important. Using a critical race theory or critical race practices helps us to explore racialization and its influence on the historical and current patterns of race relations, the social construction of knowledge and privileging voices of marginalized populations, identifying appropriate measures and interventions that captured the social constructions of race, and racial capitalism, connecting racialized exploitation and capital accumulation as fundamental causes of health inequalities. So this idea of having both a racialized society or tying labor or, or our, our ability to sort of progress as a nation economically to 
to the to the linked fates or to the fates and in, in, in social realities of black people and other marginalized groups. I will end here with a quote from Fannie Lou Hamer. Whether you have a PhD or no D, we're in this bag together. And whether you're from Morehouse or no house, we're still in this bag together. When I liberate myself, I liberate others. If you don't speak out, ain't nobody going to speak for you. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilbert, <clears throat> for that amazing presentation. If you have questions and answers, uh, give questions, please put them in um, the Q&A box. Um, oh, wow. One. That just increased really quickly. I know. I was like, give me one second. I just want to put up um, Dr. Gilbert's co-edited book again, because we had some questions about it. Um, so this is a book that is published by APHA Press. APHA is the American Public Health Association. That is our professional society. It's called Racism, Science, and Tools for the Public Health Professional. And it is co-edited um, by Dr. Gilbert, Dr. Ford, um, Dr. Griffin, and who am I missing? Um, uh, Dr. Marino Bruce. Dr. Marino Bruce. Um, and while I have a chapter in this book, full disclosure, if you buy it, I will not make any money. So um, <laughs> I suggest that uh, it is a really good book um, for those who are interested um, in this space. So some Q&A for uh, Dr. Gilbert. Uh, the first question I have here is, how are issues with self-efficacy considered in deciding behavioral response interventions? It's a great question. So the idea of self-efficacy is, um, well, we have to sort of think about self-efficacy in a couple of different ways. And so as I've tried to articulate in, 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 in some ways, behavior is, is contextual, as well as the idea of self-efficacy. And so self-efficacy is defined as sort of the confidence in one's belief um, to perform a particular behavior. Also, we have collective efficacy as well, sort of that sort of more at a, at a group level. And so some of us may feel really comfortable performing certain behaviors or doing some things um, depending on the situation or context. So for example, um, some of us may be quite comfortable exercising or being physically active when we're with friends um, versus with if we're around strangers. Also the idea that some of us may be more comfortable um, being physically active in certain neighborhoods versus other neighborhoods. And so that really does sort of even factor into one's sense of confidence in being able to perform behaviors. Um, so you're gonna know that I'm totally biased when I pick out the next question, but it's from someone else and not from me. <laughs> <laughs> About the generations of disparities research, do you think we need more third and fourth generation research? If so, what are your thoughts on how we go about doing this? Well, absolutely. Um, I mean, we've, we've done enough of documenting the problem, the nature of the problem, we've not done enough in investing in solutions to, to address health inequalities. Um, and so part of how we move, move to addressing them to third and fourth generations is we really do have to take a health equity approach. And so part of, part of what we've been able to do over time is to sort of adopt our language, but we've not always adopt our measurements. And we've also not even sort of adopt our strategies or, or changed our strategies to address those gaps that we see. And so in some ways, it's great that we've had these national reports and these national efforts to think about and consider health inequalities and health equity strategies, but we've not really invested in those types of strategies. And they're expensive, I mean, but we have to also sort of think about the return on investment. And so is it better for us to invest in systemic change so that not only do we see some, some immediate changes, but sort of generational change and shifts. And that's sort of, part of why, why we haven't sort of really moved in that direction because we think it's often costly. So I live in a state that didn't expand Medicaid and within the next week or so, that's gonna be on the ballot. And some of the people that are, have been against that have suggested that it's gonna cost more to, to the state to actually expand Medicaid. And in fact, it's not. It actually has shown to, to, to save money in states that have expanded Medicaid because you sort of 
give people um, increase their access to healthcare that probably in, that will increase their access to using primary care physicians, reduce the burden on emergency department use because now people have regular access to to a primary care physician or other healthcare provider. Can you go over racialized capitalism again? Yeah, so it's, it's this idea of, um, and so there's a really great article in the Journal of Health Education Behavior by Whitney Pirtle. Um, and it just came out within the last couple of months. And she does a really good job of unpacking this idea of racial capitalism, um, which also isn't a new idea. It's largely sort of steeped in the sociological literature. But it's this idea of how we have tied race to some, to some extent to capitalism or, or racializing certain groups to capitalism. And actually the 1619 Project is actually a really good example, um, has some really great essays of even talking about this. And so I was um, recently reading some articles about sort of the sugar industry in, in America. Um, and so the idea that we have um, built this industry around, around sugar, um, it's, it's in a lot of our foods, but we've also tied labor to that. And so if you think about even sort of people that maybe work in that industry, there's incredible occupational hazards, as an example. And so as a result of our, our desires and our needs and, and want for sugar, <laughs> um, we are placing people at a high risk. The same ways that we've also placed people at a high risk who are been deemed as essential workers. So those that work in um, hospitals, those that work in grocery stores, those that work in uh, meat production plants. And so we have linked their fates to, to their occupations and, and in a sense their health and not only their individual health, but also their families and their communities at, by extension. This question was designed for you. Um, <laughs> and you'll know this because of the way I think about your office. Um, can you please discuss the role of the Black Panthers in addressing social determinants of health in the Black community? Are you aware of any potential outcomes associated with their work? Actually, there, um, so I've not studied this extensively, but there's been a, a few papers in particular in the American Journal of Public Health that looked at sort of some of the Black Panthers' efforts to address um, not only systemic racism, but also health disparities. And so they had, um, um, they had food programs, they had early childhood education programs. And so they were really thinking strategically about what are some of the immediate needs of, of those communities that they were in, as well as how, how that might sort of factor into long-term outcomes. And so we all have talked about, or, or it's, it's been widely, widely documented that investment in children's education very early really does set them on a pathway to be successful. Um, and, and, and so and part of it is because of what we think are the values of, of education. And so the Black Panthers were really forward thinking in that, as well as I can even link that to the National Negro Health Movement um, between 19, um, 1915 and 1951 as well. So those are very similar efforts and energies. I'll just sort of make another quick, quick point. Um, really Black people have been trying to address their health for quite a long time. Um, I was on a, a call just, just recently and we were talking about sort of medical mistrust and things like that. And one of the things that I, I, I noted and I'll note here is that um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there was systemic disinvestment in black medical schools um, through the Flexner Report. And as a result of that, of that report, it closed a lot of schools that were deemed sort of um, of lower quality, lower worth. And so yes, it affected um, med schools all across the country, but it also sort of really decimated the impact of training healthcare professionals in Black communities in particular. And so um, now we have very few Black medical schools. We have very few of what we sort of know as historically Black hospitals as well. Um, and so we've not also really changed the numbers of um, Black medical students in, 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 in quite some time. And that's systemic disinvestment. And those are the kinds of things that I, that I think that we really sort of have to focus on, not only sort of the preparation of public health and healthcare professionals, how we train them and prepare them, and also, you know, how do we orient them to the kinds of work um, of thinking about health equity work uh, once they are finished with their programs. I would just suggest before the next question that um, 
folks who are interested in learning more about the pa Black Panthers, Google the um, Black Panther Manifesto, and they had a 10-point plan. Most of it is about the social determinants of health, and in fact, it predates the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. So it may be an interesting read for people. Dr. Gilbert, do you have any ideas about action steps that public health graduate students can take to decolonize and promote racial equity within our respective institutions? <laughs> uh, it's a great question. That's a tough question. Um, one of my first things to tell you as a student is be a student. Um, you can certainly help catalyze some efforts and energies, but it's certainly most important for you to enjoy the student experience. And part of that is we as, and I'm, I, you may be a student of color, you may not be a student of color, you might be an ally of some sort, but all, it is really the institution's responsibility to make that change. And I certainly understand that as a, as a student or those who sort of al uh, align themselves with marginalized students want to help make that change. And that is important. And also make sure you, car you can carve out time to do that um, before you leave those institutions. Um, and so part of that is sort of working with um, um, or developing some coalitions, working with student groups, um, as well as working with alumni networks is also really important. Um, and also don't be afraid to challenge your professors, challenge your deans, challenge the, the, the provost and the president. And so part of that is also understanding the nature and function of how universities work, because it actually really will help you to understand how large a society works and sort of also these sort of interorganizational networks and systems. Um, so the, the, the more you understand and have, have um, an appreciation of sort of the functionality and even the dysfunctionality of universities, that helps you to sort of understand where you can actually make some changes and also where, where you might sort of think about what types of demands that you want to make. And so it's important to not only think sort of at, at a local level, even within your institution, but also thinking about the systemic changes that have to happen university-wide. So for example, um, we talk about sort of the ways that we can support faculty in terms of doing community-engaged work, because in many institutions, it's frowned upon but it's also the work that we, many of us value and think that is really important that needs to happen. Also, even when we talk about people or scholars who wanna focus on health equity, health disparities work, sometimes they're discouraged or even students are sometimes discouraged from that work because it's not, it's not seen as valuable. There are probably, that probably will change over the next couple of years as everyone is interested in systemic racism and health inequalities. Um, and so that, that narrative might change a little bit, but there still may be some pushback from some folks. Um, one of the participants said they're struggling to understand a syndemic. Can you give a couple of examples of what that is? So, you know, we're, we're in a syndemic to some extent. Also, when you think about neighborhoods where there are high, high clusters or um, high probabilities of, of sort of multiple chronic diseases and, and social issues. So it's sort of disease and social problems sort of colliding together or exist or coexisting in a similar place. So when we think about or, we, or the ways that we often characterize um, communities of color, they're often characterized as, as being um, low resource as well as having high risk or high, high, um, um, high prevalence of chronic diseases. And so those sort of, those factors sort of working together then produces what we call a, a syndemic. Um, and, it, and then we can sort of, we can measure that and then we can also think about different strategies to address those, those challenges. We often sort of address one or the other and we don't often think about how do we address both of them. And I think that's part of really sort of this language around syndemics in terms of not only getting us to focus on sort of the clustering of social and health issues, but also thinking about or pushing us towards strategies. And that really does require structural change. What do you see as the steps we could take right now to reduce inequality and mortality from COVID, especially at the community or city level? So some of that does require a national strategy, I believe, as well as um, developing local and um, state level strategies. And so some of that, of course, is going to revolve around testing, um, um, changing systems and structures where not only pe are people able to access testing, but the results sort of come back faster so that people know their, their status, um, as well as being able to place resources 
just for people to access care when, it, when they need it. Um, and that's also part of the challenge. Also thinking about the ways that we can provide resources to those that, that are deemed essential employees and changing workplace structures. I'll even venture into talking a little bit about vaccines, um, just a tad. There's an expectation and even to some extent a mandate that um, sites that have been selected for, for vaccine trials um, recruit higher numbers of, um, uh, of, of participants from high risk groups. So that's um, black communities, Latino communities, elderly communities, and low income or low resource communities. And that's gonna be quite a challenge because one, folks from those groups tend to have high levels of medical mistrust. Um, also, people don't feel like they wanna be experimented on. Um, this is not only a new, a new public health problem, but it's a brand new, um, a, a brand new treatment or thinking about treatment. And you already have lots of people that don't get flu vaccines for a host of reasons. And so when we sort of think about how, what learnings we can take from other public health problems and apply them here, it's really important. The unfortunate part of, 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 the, of this answer and the reality is, is that we did not address these early enough. And it's not again that we didn't know that these problems existed. We didn't make the, the systemic investments into sort of uh, addressing them really early on to try to mitigate and prevent communities of color, low resource um, communities from being burdened by COVID-19. Someone had a question about why black women would be less sexualized in neighborhoods with a lower percentage of black people. So they're more sexualized in those, in, in those communities um, and less sexualized in communities where there are, high, where there are lower, lower percentages of, of, of blacks or higher percentages of whites. And so those are also, so in communities where black women are more sexualized, they are also less likely to be physically active because they feel less safe. Can you clarify the difference between equal access and true health equity? Sure. So equal access suggests that I can give everyone $100. And as a result of me giving you $100, you can now go access health care. The reality might be a person who has lower resources or lower access to health care previously, they may need $150, in fact. And as a result of that, that sort of addresses the equity piece. So um, equality is I give everybody the same thing. Equity actually asks the question of what's the gap between um, equality and getting you to a place that sort of levels, levels the playing field for you. And so there's these images that you might see of sort of differences between equality and equity that sort of show people on, um, on, um, on some boxes looking over a fence at a game or something like that. And so I can give everyone the same size box. Well, if you're six foot tall, you standing on that box is gonna put you much higher over the fence. Um, if you are um, 4'11", and I give you the same height box as I give someone who's six feet, you're still not gonna be able to see over the fence. And so in fact, you need a taller box to be able to see over the fence. And, and this is not the, the greatest example of showing that, but if you were to Google images or Google differences between equity and, and um, uh, equality, those are some of the things that you might see. So hopefully that, that helps with explaining um, those differences. How do you suggest public health professionals of color work to change policies that directly affect communities of color? So part of it is really just thinking about where, where do you want to make your, um, your impact? And so we can't, all of us can't solve all of the problems. And so if you have a passion, for example, for working with youth and thinking about youth inequalities, um, sort of think about sort of what's the literature, um, what are some best practices, who's working in those spaces, and if you are a person that um, is interested in working with communities, find good partners as well. Um, I'm not also suggesting that everyone work in the community. Some people are not people people, and that's okay. <laughs> Some people are, are best 
analyzing data, helping you to think about methods, helping you to think about um, strategies, uh, assessment and evaluation strategies, and that's okay. You may have a great orientation to, to that work, and you may be able to use an equity framework in, in, in that. And then there are those people who are people people, um, who can go into communities and, and have respectful conversations, listen to communities um, as a way of understanding not only their challenges, but also their assets and their sources of, re of resilience and sources of support. And so that's how I try to prepare the students that, that um, I interact with in class and also mentor. Um, and I really try to encourage them to, to find their own passion. And part of that is sort of even what I call a public health identity. Um, thinking about what you're interested in, why you're interested in it, and being genuine um, and transparent in some ways to, to, to that calling to some extent, or the things that you find really interesting and fascinating. And so it's really important to sort of, you know, center your own self um, before you go and do any of this kind of work, whether it's community engaged or even if it's sort of more, um, whether it's mixed methods or even if it's just sort of quantitative or qualitative. So you have to sort of find your own voice and thinking about how you bring that voice or, or unique perspective to the work that you want to do. Someone is asking for you to clarify the difference between syndemic and intersectionality. Well, actually, they're very similar. Um, but so intersectionality sort of derived more from thinking about um, other kinds of characteristics based on race, class, and gender, um, whereas syndemic is sort of at a population level. And so it, it's sort of intersectionality of, of, a, similar, of a similar name or, or at a higher level. And so when we think about the intersections of our identities, that's, that's sort of what intersectionality or the literature really sort of focuses on. And so certainly some of that ha has been influenced by our social and physical environments, but syndemics really sort of raises that conversation or that discussion to a population level. And so when we think about population health, it's, syndemics is sort of more of the language that we might want to use. Um, so I'm going to end with this last question. I think it's from someone who's interested in public health. So I think it's a good way to end. They ask, uh, do you think community health concentrations and MPH programs would be a good place to learn more about combating racism as a public health issue? Interesting question. <laughs> I think you set me up. Um, so I will have to admit, it depends on where you go, to, just to be honest and frank about that. Not all, school, um, not all schools of public health has that as a primary interest. It doesn't mean that you can't go to a school of public health um, with that as an interest and try to learn more. Um, also, it, it really sort of speaks to the idea of networking and thinking about different ways you can get connected to various student groups or professional associations so that you can meet those interests. Um, sometimes we go to places or, or programs because it's closed, because it's affordable, um, also even because we just got in. And, that, and all of that is okay. Um, you know, but I, so for me as a person that entered public health after um, studying other disciplines, as Dr. Goodman mentioned at, at, in my intro, um, I actually felt that public health was a great discipline and a great space for me to meet my interest in thinking about um, race and health and thinking about um, inequality, systemic inequality. And so I, I do think that as a discipline sort of writ large, it is great. Sometimes sort of how that manifests in, at, at different schools and programs may be a little bit different, but you still have an opportunity to sort of find your own voice and to sort of pursue those interests. And some of that may be through um, some of your coursework. And I will add to what Dr. Gilbert said, I think community health is a great place to learn about the social determinants of health. Um, and so I think if they're not teaching racism explicitly, they're teaching you um, some of the policies and systems and structures um, that contribute to disparities. And any um, MPH program is gonna teach you about um, the social determinants of health. Um, so we have to end here. I know people have lots of questions. There's still like 50 more questions in the, <laughs> in the Q and A box. We can't get to them all, but we'll try to save questions and address the ones that we can um, tomorrow when we um, do our introduction. Let's thank Dr. Gilbert again. You had lots of thank yous in the chat box and how amazing you are, but I already knew that because I'm only friends with amazing people. Uh, <laughs> thank you.
Um, and we really appreciate Dr. Gilbert um, for speaking with us today. I think he shared a wealth of knowledge that we will all take something, multiple things um, away from the presentation.